Hi, I just wanted to give you a couple of quick words about this service you're going to watch. This service was first held outdoors at Fowler Park, right along the lakeshore. So in fact, here's a couple of pictures from that service. And I wanted you to have that contact because you will hear the uh, service and some scripture that talk about being by the lake shore. With that, let us worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. My name is Pastor Dan, and we gather today as the people of Good Shepherd United Methodist Church here in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. It is good to be together. We have found that one of the best ways for us to begin our time of worship is to begin in song. Let us worship. Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 5. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. 
But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, again we come to you today and ask that you would move among us. That may be in word, that may be in song, that may be in fellowship, that may be in thoughts. However, however you may choose. Come and move among us. This is our prayer. Amen. So Jesus is teaching at the shore. And the crowds are are pressing in. So Jesus sees two boats pulled up along the shore. And the fishermen who are out uh, without, they're out of their boats without a catch, are cleaning their nets next to the boats. Jesus walks up and gets into one of the boats and asks them to push him out a little bit away from the shore. And then he starts teaching. Now, The Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus is teaching, but I imagine that it's about renewal or about believing in renewal or that God can bring about renewal. I think that because of how this story ends. It seems to be the point that uh, he is driving home. And when Jesus is done teaching, he looks over at Simon and tells him to take the boat out into the deep waters and to cast out his nets. Again, it's the end of a long day for Peter, actually a long night and a long day. He's tired, he's frustrated, he had no luck fishing the night before, and they'd returned to the shore to to clean and mend their nets. And now his nets are all ready for tomorrow. And here is Jesus coming to, to tell him to go back out and dirty his nets again. In the daylight. Nobody fished in the daylight. Go out into the deep water, Jesus says. And Peter looks at Jesus and he says, Seriously? We've been out fishing all night. Do you know something that we don't? I don't remember seeing a fishing license pinned up to your hat there. What makes you think you know better than we do? We're the professionals, says Peter. But maybe because Jesus gives Peter, well, one of those looks. Peter says, fine. You want us to go back out? We'll go back out in broad daylight. When nobody fishes, because you, Jesus, say so. Are you happy now? Well, of course we know. They catch so many fish that their nets begin to break, and they have to call their partner boat over to help them haul them all in. And there are so many fish that the weight of them starts causes the boats to, to sink low into the water. It's a lot of fish. It was the catch of a lifetime. And Peter, well, Peter, he's had enough. And he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. The Greek here actually reads, Get out of my neighborhood. And if I were Jesus, or if I were Peter, I would say something like this. I would say, Get out of here, Jesus. You have rocked my world. And I don't know what to make of it. I know nothing, even the things in which I'm an expert. I know nothing. You've just proven that to me. You've just done something I could never do. 
Something I don't understand. And frankly, Jesus, frankly, this scares me to death. Don't you know me? I need to be in control. I need to have power over my destiny. I need two plus two to equal four every time. I need to know what, which way is up and which way is down. I need constants. I need truth. That's how I'm put together. Get out of my neighborhood, Jesus. You and your miracles and your stories where lions lay down with lambs and we love our enemies and I catch fish from an empty lake and everything turns out all right. I don't know how to live in a world like that. So get out of my neighborhood. And I imagine Jesus putting his head back and laughing. Not a mean laugh, but a laugh that recognizes the truth about what Peter is saying, even if Peter doesn't fully recognize that truth yet. And then Jesus says, don't be afraid, my friend. From now on, you'll be catching people. And that's it. That's Peter's call story. What a strange call story. You know, there's no, oh, you of little faith, or no, go and sin no more, or no, go and sell everything that you have. No. Instead, Peter gets, do not be afraid. Which gets me to wondering, what makes this so scary? I think I know. When the God of miracles shows up to do one, we explain it away. We say, it was just a coincidence. It was just timing. And sometimes I find that explaining, even the crazy explaining, easier than the alternative. We know what to expect. We understand cause and effect. That's how we navigate our way through life. Believing in miracles or in the impossible can make us appear foolish. We are thinkers. We are rational. We know about science. We are realists. And realism does help us to navigate our world and our lives. But this story got me to wondering if sometimes I explain things away so that I can keep the scriptures under my control, which ultimately means I can keep God under my control. This story, whether you read it literally or read it metaphorically, it says the same thing. God breaks down the walls, or maybe more accurately, breaks open the nets. But God breaks down what we think is possible and points us to a future that we think is impossible. And just what is that future? That future is the new reign of God. And how do we join in to that new reign? Well, the only thing we need to join into this reign, this new reign, is a recognition that we are not a part of it yet. At least that seems to be one of the messages of this story. Peter says, I am a sinner. In other words, I think he's saying, I didn't believe you, Jesus. I didn't think this was possible. I've been relying on my ways, not on yours. Or, again, if I were Peter, I would say something like, if I can depend on me and not God, then I can keep things going. True, true. Things may not be at their best right now, but... We keep learning new things all the time. We learn more about our world and how it works all the time. We, we learn more about how we as humans work 
all the time. We can do some amazing things with medicine. People today live longer than ever before. So Jesus saying yes to your future does rock my world. A future of loving my neighbor. A future of praying for my enemy. A future that says God loves all of us. It's no wonder to me that Peter tells Jesus to get out of his neighborhood. This is a strange call story. Actually, it's just plain a strange story. And yet, it's what every fisherman or fisherwoman dreams of. That great once-in-a-lifetime catch. The big one! Simon and P- Simon Peter and his buddies have the once-in-a-lifetime catch. That big windfall has finally come their way. But do you notice something? Do you notice that right after the fishermen bring in the fish to the shore, they didn't stay there to enjoy all the praise and the profits. They left everything and followed Jesus. We never hear Peter speak again about that once-in-a-lifetime catch. All this got me to wondering, what will it take for all of us, for each of us, to say in Peter's words that we are sinners? How and with what? Would Jesus have to fill our net so full that we might see God's future, God's reign? What would you, what would I, have to bring in from the deep water? Is it something you've tried to do on your own but come up empty? Is it a place I've tapped for hope and sustenance that has yielded nothing? What will it take? In the healing stories that precede this story in Luke, the crowds are amazed. But in this story, those first disciples go beyond amazement, way beyond amazement. They leave their nets and all those fish, and they follow Jesus. I wonder if part of this story isn't trying to tell us that the things that we think are so important are the things that are not the things that really matter in this new reign of God. I chose this scripture today because of the lake, Lake Gennesaret and Luke and Fowler Lake for us here today. We may be in a different place, and we may be in a different time, but the question remains the same. What would your net, what would my net, with what would they need to be filled, so filled that it would blow our minds enough that we would leave it all behind and follow? That's a question that only you can answer. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we move now into a time of prayer, I will lead us in a pastoral prayer, and then I invite you to join with me, and together we will pray the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we read in the Bible how you created the world through your word. Your word is powerful, and so are our words. They can heal, bring a smile, or be a testimony of love, but they can also hurt. 
Give us your wisdom, God of the word, that we can speak well your words of love and shalom and compassion as we strive to live with one another. We pray for courage that we can live out our faith, giving witness with our words and our actions that we follow you. We pray for the will to follow wherever you may lead. And finally, we pray for love, your love in us. May we show your love to those around us, our neighbors, that they will see your love in us. Holy One, you tell us to bring our concerns to you, so hear us as we bring to you those that we care about in this silence. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for loving us. We love you. We close our prayer by praying together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, as we prepare to go out from this time of worship into the world, let us go out with these words of blessing, these words of benediction. May the God who made you and loves you and is with you at all times guide your words and your actions. Let us go out in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. See you soon. Prepare for